We'll be getting our message from Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, starting in verse 17. Luke 23 and 17. For the necessity, he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas. For, for who for a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder, was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Our dearest, precious, and heavenly Father, I pray that you just bring your anointing down upon your word tonight, Lord God. And I pray that you just use this, this humble vessel, Lord God, that you may use my mouth to say the things that you want to say and to get across the message in which you've laid upon my heart. Lord, I thank you for all those that have come. And Lord, I pray that anyone that's here within the sound of my voice, Lord God, that you could use my voice to help them get through some situation or something in their life that may be burdening them down tonight. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen. This man, Barabbas, was, it says, a murderer. And Jesus came even for the murderer. Jesus came for those that nobody thought had a chance. Jesus came for me, the Barabbas. And you, the Barabbas. You know, we just came through Holy Week, and um, as God laid this on my heart this afternoon, I was like, Lord, we just went through all of these scriptures. We just studied all these scriptures. What else could I say? And what he kept bringing me to is, remember where in which you came from. Remember what that Holy Week was about. Remember what they said and what they did to me on a daily basis, and it will help you with your walk with me. And if you think about it, if, if I think about the way in which the, the crowd must have been, it may have started in a simple, somebody said, crucify him. And then somebody else said it, and then it got louder. And in my mind, I'm thinking, then, then the whole crowd just started chanting, and screaming and going along with it. And that happens in today's world, doesn't it? Yeah. One person says something really loud and somebody else just goes along with it because that person, and it's like a peer pressure thing and they all get wrapped up in it. And even though it's not right, there they are. Yeah. They're all right in the middle of it. They're all going along with it. They're all saying those same things. But what they're really doing underneath it all is their, their sin is crucifying Christ. Our sin is what caused the crucifixion of Christ. But he did it for them just as much as he did it for me and he did it for you. There's nobody out there that he can't and won't save. And for our little mind, my little mind, my pea brain mind, I can't imagine some of these things that people can do that God can forgive them for. But then he brings back to me, remember from where which I brought you from. Uh -huh. You may not want other people to repeat where in which I brought you from either. You know, keep so humble that way. Uh -huh. Some people say, well, don't think about those things because they're back there. I want to know and remember just because they stay back there. So that I know that how far he's brought me, that I can keep going forward. Mm -hmm. I listened to um, Calvin Ray Evans the other day, and he was talking about how if we're not getting better, we're getting worse. And I agree with that. Because in our walk with Christ, we can either get closer to him and move closer and do what he wants for our lives. Or we, if we stay where we say, well, we're, we're good enough or we're... We're stagnant. He, the way he explained it was even a flower, once it's fully blossomed, is now dying. Because it's reached its peak. And then it has to start dying. Well, we don't want to start dying. So 
we got to keep walking, and we've got to keep being in love with him, and we've got to keep striving to be what he is the example for us to be. We have to remember we were Barabbas. Mm -hmm. We have to remember when we crossed paths with those people, we were once them. Maybe not in that same situation, but we were once needing a Savior. We were once in that place where it was so necessary that somebody let us know that there was a Savior. I just can't even imagine screaming, crucify him. But I do know in my past, my actions have done that. I have caused that kind of pain and infliction on him because he died for all of those things that I did. And that right there should keep us striving to be more like him. Because if we remember what pain and anguish and things he went through just so that we can be, imagine, just so we can have the freedom to whatever we did in this beautiful day, whatever it was you did, we had that freedom of choice because of what he did on Resurrection Sunday, what he did for us, what he's continued to do for us, what he blesses us with, the things that he says to our spirit when we're so far down and we feel like there's nowhere to go and there's nothing else to do and we pray and he speaks to our spirit. Isn't that wonderful? It's just so wonderful. But if we can continue to remember that we were once not Barabbas. We were once somebody who was ashamed of what we had done. We were once somebody that didn't think we were going to be okay. I knew that I didn't think I was going to be okay. I knew when I was sick and I was dying, I wasn't worried about this mortal body. I knew enough to know that if something happened to this mortal body, I was going to spend eternity in hell. And you know, sometimes people will say, well, I just can't think about all those things that they do. I just can't think about it because I don't want to. I just don't want to think about it. I've heard people tell me, "Well, I don't want to deal with them because they got too, they're just too. There's too much. It's too messy." I'm so glad that Jesus never thought I was too messy. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that He never said to me, "You know what, Cheryl? You went too far. You've done too much, and I can't use you." Even if he never used me to do this again, just speaking to me, just being with me, just being my friend, I can't at this point even imagine what that would be like. But there's so many people out there that don't even know what a wonderful friendship they could have with our Savior. They walk and talk the things that the rest of the world says because that's all they've known. We have to be those people, and instead of screaming, crucify him, we have to say, Jesus loves you. Imagine if everywhere we went, a crowd of people just spontaneously said, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And why couldn't we? Why couldn't we? Haven't you seen those people that just break out in song? I love those videos where people will just break out in song in the middle of a crowd, and people start gathering in and singing. Well, what if we were in the middle of Walmart and just start screaming, Jesus loves you. Amen. Jesus loves you. How many people might echo it through there? I think I want to try it sometime. <laughs> and I think I'm just about bold enough to do it. But I, I think it would be so awesome because if they can get people to go along with their things, it's because we, as a, as a Christian person, and I know me for a fact. I have some reserves. Sometimes I think, oh, they don't want to hear this. They're not gonna, they're not gonna like this. But I gotta get past that. Because so many times in my life, I'm sure somebody looked at me and said, She's a lost cause. You ain't gonna listen to me. But I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad they still told me that Jesus loved me. And I'm glad they still told me that I could be saved. Because I didn't know that. No one would tell me that. 
Now, luckily, I went to vacation Bible school when I was about yay big, and I remember about Jesus when I needed him really much mm -hmm. in my life. But I'm so glad that somebody had the desire to pray for me. That's why I got saved. That's why you all got saved. Mm -hmm. Somebody took you as a burden on their heart and they prayed for you. So tonight I'm going to challenge you to go home and write a list of your Barabbas in your life. People that you know need that Savior. You can have five people. You can have one person you want to focus on. You can have ten people. But focus on one of them at least. That Barabbas needs Jesus. And it could be your family member. It could be a neighbor. It doesn't matter. And you don't have to tell me or anybody else. But focus on that person. Because I'm telling you, if you focus on that person, God is going to move in their life. He's going to move. He's going to make a move. Look how he made a, a, a move in this man's life. And all he did was step up and be that sacrificial lamb for him, for you, for me, and for all those Barabbases we know in our lives. He did it for all of them. They've all done horrible things. We've all done things we were ashamed of. And that's how he got a hold of us. That's how he knew we needed him. That's how our heart got broken and contrite. And we knew that if I died, I'm not going where I ought to be. But that was because somebody pre-prayed for you to soften your heart, to get that in there, to break open that shell, so somebody plant that seed so that someone else can water it, so that eventually they're going to get saved. We need that in a mighty way. If we ever want to see revival, big revival, the church as a whole, not just our church, has to wake up and has to start telling people again how much Jesus loves them. I think that the devil gets them so tongue-tied and afraid to say something to offend someone because everyone's offended now, except everybody's offended. Everybody's offended against things, and sin seems to not be offensive anymore. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it's not to him. Right. So if we follow what he says, sin is still offensive to God. We have to stand up and still say that it's offensive to God. And, my, and, and I myself have to. To friends, to family, we can't just sit back and say, well, it's okay, I understand. No, if it's not right, and God knows it's not right, somebody needs to tell them it's not right. Because how else will they know? That's why God gave Moses our Ten Commandments. Because they didn't know. Until they had that, they had no idea what it was that they were doing so wrong. That was their guide. Their, that was their guide. If we don't tell them what's in this book, so many people don't read it anymore. And what I'll say to somebody once I tell them where it is, Go read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Google it or get a book out and read it yourself. It's right there. It will tell you what you're doing is not okay. Because I don't want to see people die and go to hell. I don't. I don't want to see another person go. If I could stop it, I would. And I'm sure we all would love to see our whole family not have to go through that. All of them. But I do challenge you to write down your Barabbas this week and just keep focusing on them in your prayer closet. That one, two, five names, whatever. You know, write them all down and just keep focusing on those people. Because I'm telling you, it works. When I started... <clears throat> really getting serious in my prayer time about four or five years ago, what I did is I printed uh, a piece of paper with all their pictures on it. And I would just lay my hands over it and pray and pray and pray and pray. And nothing that I did, it's all for him, but five out of the ten people on that page got saved. That's pretty good odds yes. for God. He touched those five people. Not 
just because of me. It's because he did what he wanted to do. But I was consistent, and I continued to pray for those people that I knew were lost and undone and needed a Savior. Now, I also, I also would witness to these people, but God made a mighty move. If we visualize what we want God to do for our family, for our friends, when it comes to their salvation, that has to make God smile. Because he came so that no one shall die lost. No one. So I'm sure that if you would take the time and focus on those people, and, I, and I, tonight I'm calling them your Barabbas, if you focus on them, just then, let's see the mighty hand of God move like never before. Because he will. Because we would be in God's will because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we were lost. And these people are lost. And as long as we take that opportunity to share that and pray for them and get that true burden on your heart. And when you have a real burden on your heart, don't ask him for a burden on your heart if you're really not serious too. Mm -hmm. Because he may wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and now's your time to pray, Brandon. Now I want you to pray. And you may be up all night praying. He's woke me up before and I didn't know who I'm supposed to pray for. Just start praying. And then a name pops up or then a whatever. But he will do that if you say, God, please put a burden on my heart. Mm -hmm. But don't ask him unless you really want one. Because he will give you one. And he'll give you an unrelenting one until it's whatever the situation is. There's times I've prayed for people, I have no idea what they're going through. But their name came up, and God wanted me to pray for them, and he knew all about it. And that's another thing. We don't need to know what others, what, what each other are going through. Mm -hmm. We can pray for one another, and, and just when your face pops into my head, I can pray for you. Because we all go through things every single day. Yes. Every week, every month. There's all kinds of things that cross our path. But take that time and pray for your Barabbas. And see the mighty hand of God move. And now that we're past the Resurrection Sunday, just don't forget what he went through for us. Mm -hmm. Don't forget what they did to him. Don't forget what our sin did to get him there. And don't ever forget that his blood, his precious blood, one drop of his blood cleansed your soul and made you whole. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to me. That just, whoo, it just, I, I can't even imagine that one little trickle from that wonderful, pure Lamb of God Save this wretched sinner girl from a devil's hell. And he did. And he'll do it for our kids. He'll do it for our in-laws. He'll do it for our aunts and uncles and cousins. Whomever may be lost and undone without him. The blood is never dried up. It's never going to lose its power. Amen. It's always going to be there. We just have to show it and share it. And continue to give it out freely. Because he gave it to us freely. So we're to give it back out freely. We're not supposed to leave here tonight. And go to a store and get frustrated with the checkout girl. And be mad at her. And, and frustrated with her. That's not how we're supposed to do these things. We're supposed to go out and gush the love that he poured all over me. In here. Out there on them. Yes. That's what he wants for me. That's what he wants from you. He wants to pour his spirit into us so much that it's just overflowing and spilling out everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. On whoever you work with, whoever you talk to. Because think about it. Who I can touch, you'll probably never meet. Who he can touch, I'll probably never meet. That's why we all were saved. Because we all have a circle that doesn't include all of us. You all touch different people at different spaces in their life. And different ages and different backgrounds. But they're all God's children. And he wants them all to be 
say. And he wants none to perish. And he stepped up as that blameless, spotless lamb and took on the sin of the whole world for us. Not for us to sit back and say, thank you, Jesus, which we should thank him. But that's not all we're supposed to do. We're supposed to freely give the gift that he gave us. It's better to give than to receive. Have you heard that before? That's what we ought to do. Give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away. It doesn't cost you anything to just say, Jesus loves you. Jesus can help you. Jesus can help what ails you. Jesus can help your sickness. Jesus can help your drug addiction. Jesus can pull you out of your desperation. Jesus can give you hope. There's so many people out there right now hopeless. Mm -hmm. And they're sad. And they're depressed. And they think no one cares. I sure wish that we had a way to have a list of those people where we could just call and give them some inspiration or some hope every day. And if you know somebody like that, do that. Because that's the best thing you can do. It's just be that person. Just give them a call and say, you know what? You came across my heart today. I just wanted to say good morning. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> they may not have heard from anybody for four or five days. You may have just made their whole month. And it took you five seconds out of your day. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that came from, but... <laughs> <laughs> but now, as we wrap things up, I want you to just spend the rest of this week thinking about those people... <laughs> that could be that Barabbas in your life. Pray for them. Hold them close to your heart. Get in your prayer closet and pray for them. And just remember that God will bless the, his will. And that is his will. Because he doesn't want to see any of them perish without him. I have children that I'm going to pray for. Anybody else wants to come up and pray for somebody with me, you're more than welcome. But I have kids and family members that are lost and undone, and they need Jesus. And right now I think that I just need to pray really hard for them. So if anybody else wants to pray for someone, you're more than welcome to. But that's about all God gave me on this. But I just, I just know that... If we hold on to that Resurrection Sunday feeling all year long, imagine the depth of our relationship with Christ by the end of the year. Because we have that powerful feeling of that Resurrection Sunday indwelling inside of us all year. I just think that would be amazing. God bless you. Amen.